everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds and the 33rd Annual Holocaust Memorial Lecture. This uh, lecture series is dedicated to the millions of Jews, Roma, Sinti, disabled, political prisoners, and other undesirables who were murdered by the Nazis during the period of National Socialism between 1933 and 1945. In particular, our focus in Medicine Grand Rounds is to explore the intersection of politics, government, science, and medicine, which in many cases resulted in an evil collaboration between medical professionals and institutions and the National Socialist regime to advance their sinister policies rationalized as the pursuit of scientific advancement. These ethical transgressions should serve as a warning to us all that the pursuit of science and medicine needs to be first and foremost grounded in ethics, morality, independence, and benevolence. Today, we are privileged to have Dr. Edith Sheffer as our guest speaker. She received her undergraduate degree in history and literature from Harvard University and her PhD in history from University of California, Berkeley. She is currently senior fellow at the Institute of European Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. She's an accomplished author and has been recognized for her critically acclaimed book in 2018 titled Asperger's Children, The Origins of Autism in Nazi Vienna, which investigates the origins of autism diagnosis and how it was influenced by Nazi psychiatry. The book also examines the shoddy research methodology employed as well as a violation of moral and ethical codes resulting in mistreatment and sometimes murder of patients and research subjects. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sheffer to Washington University. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's really quite an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to be presenting an overview of my research on Hans Asperger and his involvement in the so-called euthanasia program that murdered children considered to be disabled. And I would like to be sensitive to the subject. I suspect most people in this room know someone who has been diagnosed with autism or Asperger disorder. And the material I'll be presenting is extremely disturbing. Um, but I do think that it's important that this information is known. This is the obligatory disclosure form. I have none, um, so I'll just skip ahead. So in the United States, according to the CDC, one in 36 children are now diagnosed on the autism spectrum. This is an exponential rise. This is up from one in 5,000 in 1975. So what is going on? The reasons for this rise are much debated medical, genetic, environmental. But one of the factors that we can all agree on is that Hans Asperger's idea of an autism spectrum took hold in the 1990s. For decades in the United States, most went by the American Leo Kanner's definition of autism. And Kanner looked at children who were relatively similar to one another. They had severe cognitive impairments and great difficulty with speech. Hans Asperger had a much broader idea of autism. He included children with milder challenges who we might today call Asperger's. And he is credited with the idea that we have of an autism spectrum. Now I'm here today to present how he developed his diagnosis in the Third Reich. He had a heroic reputation as a resistor of Nazism on his Wikipedia page when I began my research, it said that he risked his life to protect children from the Nazi killing program that killed children considered to be disabled. Um, Asperger supposedly emphasized the special abilities of children to stress their value to the state. And according to this theory, he used the autism diagnosis as a psychiatric Schindler's list to protect them. So I went off to Vienna really excited to tell this heroic story and my agent was all excited. And um, what I found in the very first file I looked in Vienna was not a heroic story, but an absolute horror story with for, far reaching implications for how we talk about autism and Asperger today. So let's start at the beginning. I wanna give you the long history of how Asperger came to this place. 
He was born in 1906 in Hausbrunn, 50 miles outside Vienna. He excelled at school with special talents in languages, literature, and history. Some have speculated that Asperger actually bore traits of what he would later call Asperger syndrome, although I have my own thoughts on that I can answer in the Q&A. He was most drawn to science, however, and in 1925, at age 19, he left for medical studies at the University of Vienna. Now, Vienna was in great turmoil at the time. It had been the cultural capital of Europe at the turn of the 20th century, the birthplace of modernism and glittering culture, but it was a disaster after World War I. The metropolis suffered severe political and economic crises. Street children flooded Vienna's institutions and the city's child development professionals rushed in to help. You can see at the bottom, Sigmund and Anna Freud were involved in a lot of charitable work to help these children. And so in the 1920s, Vienna founded actually one of the most progressive social welfare systems in the world, known as the Vienna system, with an army of highly trained social workers, as well as eminent psychoanalysts like Sigmund and Anna, um, and psychiatrists to help. So I'll be focusing at the University of Vienna Children's Hospital. And one leader in these efforts was Clemens von Pirke, and he turned the Children's Hospital into one of the most renowned pediatric facilities in the world. He was progressive, he was open to experimentation and to the advancement of women and Jews. So when one idealistic pediatrician who was Jewish, Erwin Lazar, you could see at the bottom, came to him with an experimental idea for a new clinic, Pirke was game. So Lazar wanted to create an entirely new discipline, which he called heilpädagogik, which I translate to curative education. And it was this idea of integrating medicine, psychology, and pedagogy to treat the whole child, to see the child in a holistic fashion. And this is important because Asperger would inherit this clinic. So Clemens von Pirke and his wife committed double suicide in 1929. This was a huge shock as he'd even been considered a contender for president of Austria. And Pirke was replaced by the far right-wing Franz Hamburger. Hamburger will become Asperger's mentor, which is why he's an important figure. And he had joined the Nazi party early on in Austria when it was essentially a terrorist organization and it was banned. And here he is standing inside a conspicuous sunbeam before Photoshop, I suppose, surrounded by a throng of adoring students and nurses. So Hamburger really changed Pierre K's facility. Um, he was known for an anti-scientific attitude and he had his doctors practice primary care and eugenics over medical specialization and research. And Hamburger purged Jewish and liberal faculty prioritizing right-wing reliability. And one of his first hires was 25-year-old Hans Asperger. Asperger revered Hamburger from their first meeting in 1931, saying he was eager to help him, quote, rectify the errors of Pirke's leadership. And you can see Asperger in this photograph of hospital staff on the lower right. So Hamburger placed Asperger in the curative education clinic and named Asperger director of the clinic within two years over the heads of longtime staffers, some of whom were Jewish, despite Asperger's youth and inexperience. But Asperger had solid right-wing credentials. He had memberships in several anti-liberal, anti-modern, anti-socialist, and anti-Semitic organizations. And just as an example, in 1934, just 10 days after Austria declared itself an Austro-fascist state, a single party state, Asperger joined that single fascist party, the Fatherland Front. Okay, now this is a bear of a slide, but there's a payoff, so stay with me. Um, under Hamburger and Asperger, Lazar's original field of curative education moved away from Vienna's mainstream. So this is a digital network map of linkages among leading psychiatrists and psychoanalysts in the 1920s and 30s. 
And we assembled a database of the most prominent figures in the field and tracked their intellectual, social, and uh, institutional linkages. We looked at who trained with whom, who married whom, who vacationed with whom. And what we found at this time, this is really the beginning of child psychiatry, that there really wasn't much of an intellectual difference between psychoanalysis and psychiatry. You can't really disaggregate them. Many people trained, you see that huge name, Julius Wagner Jaurog, many rotated through his psychological uh, neurological clinic, including Lazar. But many people who were more liberal and Jewish tended to go to the trendier field of psychoanalysis. And there you see our friends Sigmund and Anna Freud again at the bottom. And so this chart really shows polarization that's political and social. So you have the Jewish leftist psychoanalysts at the bottom. Clemens von Pirke and Lazar had been tied to these networks, but there you see Asperger and Hamburger grew increasingly isolated up at the top with far right wing and psychiatrists. So the point here is that Vienna's ideological split predated the Nazi annexation of Vienna. This was already happening. Hamburger was a Nazi and so were the people that Asperger was working with. And Asperger and his crew were really peripheral and way off from the mainstream. Meanwhile, we're in the 1930s the staff at the Curative Education Clinic retained a progressive vent, bent. They had trained under Lazar. And the nurse and educational director, Victorina Zak, generated many of their therapies that we would recognize today. Play therapy, music therapy, a lot of um, free ranging, compassionate treatment of children. And following her lead, clinic staff paid attention to youths who seemed to have difficulty socializing. And collectively, the clinic used the term autistic. So this is documented that this clinic was using the term autistic long before Asperger ever did. But they did not consider autistic to be a negative pathology. And so two Jewish uh, members of the clinic, Georg Frankel and Ani Weiss, Ani is pictured here, each published articles about autistic characteristics in the mid 1930s advocating benevolent care. Frankel and Weiss were both Jewish and they thankfully emigrated to the United States. And Frankel left with the help of Leo Kanner, who's pictured here, the father of American child psychiatry and the first to develop autism as a standalone diagnosis. And one question that remains, um, that is raised by this research is did Ani Weiss and Georg Frankel bring the idea of autism to Leo Kanner across the Atlantic? They were in his inner circle and Kanner's first case study of autism was actually based on Frankel's notes. So this remains to be explored, but I think it's a really tantalizing connection. So meanwhile, let's go back to Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Nazi child psychiatrists were also diagnosing social awkwardness in youths, but they were much, much harsher about it. So children in the Third Reich were to possess strong community bonds. They were supposed to be enthusiastic participants in collective activities such as the Hitler Youth. They were supposed to um, feel these metaphysical collective purpose in a fascist state. And this is really the idea of fascism at the heart of Nazism, the importance of the group over the individual. So bear with me as I go through the number of Nazi psychiatrists who are talking about this. These are all Asperger's senior colleagues. Asperger was a very minor figure at the time, but all these guys were talking about social connectedness. So Paul Schroeder, who is the leader of Nazi child psychiatry in the upper corner, called this readiness to serve the community Gemut. And Gemut is one of German's um, famously untranslatable words, but it used to mean in the romantic period, soul. But Nazi psychiatrists gave it social meaning as well as a national, racial, and political caste. So German, the German race supposedly had a lot of Gemut. The French did not, the French had reason. Um, socialists and communists had less gemut, but Hitler had a lot of gemut. So you see the kind of political cast gemut is taking. 
So in the spring of 1934, Asperger interns with Schroeder in Leipzig and is inspired by Schroeder's idea of Gemüt. And another man that Asperger followed was Schroeder's student, Hans Heinze, who's pictured next to him, who wrote on the phenomenology of Gemüt, denouncing children's lack of community. And Heinze would become one of the top three leaders in the Nazi child killing program. So Reich child psychiatrists increasingly sought to measure children's quantity of gamut, and they develop, develop three by four matrices, they develop percentages of heritability, um, and they use the word autism to describe some of these um, characteristics. And I just wanna stress that these publications all predated Asperger's work on autism. Again, he was only in his thirties and a very minor figure. So in other words, the idea of autism already pervaded Nazi child psychiatry and Asperger would simply follow in the footsteps of his senior colleagues. So now we are the morning of March 12th, 1938. The German Wehrmacht rolled across the border into Austria to annex Austria and met jubilant crowds. Asperger and Vienna witnessed tremendous change. There was vicious violence against Jews, regarded by many as among the worst in the Reich. Vienna was about 10% Jewish and anti-Semitism there was rife. People assaulted Jews in the streets, plundered their stores, homes, and synagogues. This was not yet happening in Germany, but it was in Vienna. At the University of Vienna, Asperger's colleagues were purged en masse. The medical school removed 78% of its faculty. Imagine here, 78% of the faculty just being removed overnight. And these are predominantly Jews, including three Nobel Prize winners. Now, Hamburger and Asperger's clinic survived the purges unscathed. Why? They'd already purged their Jews. Um, and in fact, Asperger and his colleagues thrived during the Third Reich. The expulsion of so many prominent Jewish and leftist psychoanalysts and physicians created a vacuum that expanded their opportunities. For Asperger, one opportunity was naming his own diagnosis. So 1937, I hate text slides, but I think there's a payoff here. This is a year before the annexation. Asperger warned against creating childhood diagnoses. He wrote, quote, there is many approaches as there are different personalities. It is impossible to establish a rigid set of criteria for a diagnosis, okay, impossible. Then here we are months after the Nazi annexation, Asperger up and introduces his own diagnosis. This well-characterized group of children who we name autistic psychopaths because the confinement of the self, autos, has led to a narrowing of relations to their environment. So here I want you to note that Asperger named autism a psychopathy, which carried connotations in German psychiatry of criminality and depravity. So criminals were psychopaths, right? This is a very pejorative term. And he was moving away from the non-judgmental tradition of the curative education clinic into the tradition of Nazi child psychiatry. Also right after the Nazi annexation, Asperger begins to work for the Nazi government in a number of capacities. He is volunteering to work in the system. So he consults for the juvenile justice system and the city's remedial schools. And well, what does that mean? He's evaluating children for institutionalization or incarceration. So he's locking children up. And what happens to children in these Nazi institutions, I will get to. He also quickly joined Nazi organizations, the German Labor Front, the National Socialist People Wel Welfare Organization. He applied to consult for the Hitler Youth now, Asperger did not join the Nazi party, and much has been made of this fact, suggesting he was a resistor, and this saved him after the war from being purged. But not joining the Nazi party was not unusual. Only three in 10 physicians in Vienna joined the Nazi party. And at the same time, he did apply to join the National Socialist German Physicians League, which was a fight organization of the Nazi party. It was a subset of the Nazi party. And most importantly, Hamburger trusted him. 
Hamburger, who ran the hospital, said doctors should be downright saturated with National Socialist principles, and he kept Asperger director of his own clinic. For example, he also had Asperger in the leadership of one of his prized programs, which I just think is worth mentioning, uh, motorized mother advising, which sounds great. These guys drove out to rural uh, areas in this health car and doctors and nurses would dispense mother's medical advice. And this sounds great, right? But they also acted as the eyes and ears of the Nazi regime and they would index children who they thought were disabled or genetically tainted and kept records that would later be put to use for their extermination. And records show that about 22% of children who were killed in Vienna came from these regions that Asperger directed with this motorized mother advising. In the fall of 1940, Asperger began to work as a consultant for Vienna's public health office which sounds like a benign office, but it was actually the center of racial hygiene measures in the city. This office coordinated forced sterilizations, deportations to concentration camps, and the killings of people continued to be disabled, which is our topic now. So child euthanasia, and I'd like to put that in quotes, was Hitler's first program of mass extermination. It predated the killing of Jews and other groups. It was begun by Hitler in 1939 to get rid of children who were regarded as a drain on the state and a danger to its uh, gene pool. But euthanasia, I wanna stress, is a misnomer. Most of the victims were physically healthy. They were not suffering. They were not terminally ill. They were simply deemed to have physical, psychological, or behavioral defects. So between five and 10,000 children perished in around 37 special wards in the Reich. And these were in the Reich, these weren't like extermination camps that killed Jews that were in Poland and elsewhere in Eastern Europe. This was happening inside communities. So I'm gonna focus on Spiegelgrund, which was one of the deadliest, where almost 800 children perished and many, many ordinary people knew what was happening. Newspapers tried to deny the killings, but there were public protests at the killing center in the fall of 1940 that were dispersed by the police and SS. And Asperger knew what was going on, as he admitted later in life. So in contrast to our mechanized images of the Holocaust, the child euthanasia program involved intimate killing, typically done by the doctors and nurses, especially women, who cared for their ward's daily needs. Killings were done in the youth's own beds. Staff would issue overdoses of sedatives and so they would mix it into their cocoa powder, which the children would eat. And then when the children grew too weak to eat, they would inject them with barbiturates and the children would waste away and grow ill and um, die usually of what they would call pneumonia. So Asperger was at the eye of the storm of the euthanasia program, close to its leading figures in Vienna. And I often get the question, well, what options did Asperger have? Um, if he didn't practice, how would he have like supported his five children? And this is my answer. He was in the top echelons of this killing system. Franz Hamburger, who we discussed, was Asperger's mentor and collaborator for 13 years. He authorized dozens of transfers of children to Spiegelgrund. And he also conducted numerous lethal experiments at the children's hospital where Asperger worked. So Asperger would be walking down the hall while Hamburger students were depriving babies of fats and vitamin A and watching the babies waste away. Um, Hamburger also infected the babies with tuberculosis and watched them die. In 1941, Asperger and Hamburger co-founded with Max Gundel, also in the upper corner, the Vienna Society for Curative Education. Gundel was known as the head of racial hygiene in Vienna. He accelerated the deportation of Vienna's Jews to concentration camps, and he was the city director of Spiegelgrund. Now, the most uh, enigmatic character in this is Erwin Jekelius, who's in the bottom corner. He was a fellow Hamburger student and the medical director of Spiegelgrund, and he worked with Asperger in, the, in his clinic for five years. 
He was also in charge of adult euthanasia in Vienna, overseeing the deaths of thousands of adults. And he was infamous. Viennese widely called him the mass murderer of Steinhoff. The BBC reported on his activities, and the British Royal Air Force even dropped leaflets calling him the Lord of the Syringe. He was so involved with the regime that he was engaged to the woman right next to him who might look familiar, Hitler's sister. Um, he was engaged and Hitler actually greatly disapproved of the match. We don't know why, maybe he didn't want his sister marrying a mass murderer, which would be ironic, but he had Jekyllius arrested and sent to the Eastern Front, which is a convenient way to get rid of an undesirable uh, brother-in-law. So not only did Asperger associate with the leaders of Spiegelgrund, he advocated the transfer of the most disabled children to Spiegelgrund. In a talk he gave in Vienna and then published in the prestigious Munich Medical Weekly, Asperger said that for all difficult cases, only a long and continuous observation is proper, like those carried out at his own clinic or the, in the reformatory Spiegelgrund. And Asperger followed his own advice. So for example, he was the medical expert on a commission, a seven member city commission that transferred children from Guggen care facility to Spiegelgrund. So in 1942, in a single day, this commission reviewed 35 cases. How much time did they spend on each of those 35 cases? Five minutes each. And they transferred all 35 children to Spiegelgrund for Jekyllius action. And this was a death sentence. They called them incapable of educational and developmental engagement. And all 35 children were killed. Asperger also re recommended the transfer of children to Spiegelgrund directly from his clinic. It is difficult to know how many children he transferred due to the fragmentary record base, but we do know that at least two children he transferred were killed. Two and a half year old Hertha Schreiber was the youngest of nine children. She was severely disabled by meningitis and diphtheria. Asperger concluded, her quote, accommodation in Spiegelgrund is absolutely necessary. Hertha's mother reportedly told the presiding doctor at Spiegelgrund, quote, if the child could not be helped, perhaps it would be better if she should die as she would have nothing in this world anyway. And this is perhaps a topic for the Q&A. Parents often did express death wishes for their children and requested that the doctors um, release them from the suffering of the world. It's another topic. Hertha did die two months after Asperger's transfer. Asperger also recommended the transfer of five-year-old Elizabeth Schreiber to Spiegelgrund. One nurse wrote in a daily report that Elizabeth could only speak a single word, mama, and that she, quote, had a friendly nature, is very affectionate and flattering with caregivers, if she is treated strictly, she will cry and hug the nurse. Elizabeth was killed four months after she was admitted to Spiegelgrund. Her brain was harvested and kept in a collection of over 400 children's brains in Spiegelgrund's cellar. Meanwhile, Asperger is working on his research. So remember in 1937, he wrote, it's impossible to establish a rigid set of criteria for a diagnosis. Then a year later, after the Nazi annexation, he comes out with this idea of autistic psychopathy because the confinement of the self has led to a narrowing of relations to their environment. Now, year by year, his definition of autistic psychopathy grows harsher. So in 1940, he defined a group of abnormal children who we refer to as autistic psychopaths. These loner children fall out of every community. They live their own lives without an emotional relationship with the environment and therefore also react abnormally to the needs of the environment. So note his language has become far more pejorative. These children are abnormal, behaving abnormally, and he's more concerned with social connectedness. These children are loners and have a defect of emotion. So in 1944, Asperger published his postdoctoral thesis for promotion to associate professor. And 
Now imagine the pressure on him. He's up for promotion under Hamburger, a rabid Nazi who's killing children. And he even strengthens his definition of autistic psychopathy. He wrote, the autist is only himself and is not an active member of the greater organism which he is influenced by and which he influences constantly. So now we have children's membership in a greater organism. For those of you familiar, this is fully fascist language. I mean, what is a greater organism of the folk? Um, he also finally adopts Nazi psychiatry's central tenet of gemut, calling psychopathy at its core a disharmony of gemut. And in his preface, he cites all of his colleagues in Nazi child psychiatry. He also grows quite harsh in his descriptions. He increasingly stressed the cruelty and sadistic traits of autistic psychopaths and their, quote, autistic acts of malice. So the point here is year by year, Asperger's definition of autism become more and more pejorative and concerned with children's aptitude for community. And in short, this is really a diagnosis of social maladjustment in a society that increasingly prized the collective. He was essentially defining autism and Nazism as inverse states of being. And as a speaker of Greek and Latin, he may have been aware that the root of fascism, fascio, the bundle or group, and the root of autism or autos, the condition of self. So you could say autism was the psychological opposite of Nazism. So Asperger did prize what he saw as the special abilities of some autistic children in math and other technical subjects. And he said they were on the favorable end of the autistic range. These are his words. He held a highly gendered view, however, declaring, quote, the autistic personality is an extreme variant of male intelligence, of the male character. And he's echoing stereotypes of the time. Asperger said boys had, quote, a gift for logical ability, abstraction, precise thinking, and formulating. Whereas girls, of course, were more gifted for the concrete and practical. So in autism, the male pattern is exaggerated to the extreme. And whereas Asperger believed that many of the boys could be remediated due to their unique male intelligence and gave them intensive help and therapy, he was far more dismissive of girls who showed similar traits to the boys. The girls were not to be remediated or educated but recommended for hormone treatment or sterilization or worse. And one of his two most prominent case studies of autistic psychopathy, and I wanna stress his famous thesis is really a rush job. It is based on four case studies, four. And he only really goes into depth on two of them. So Asperger said that Fritz fell out of the community, this is Asperger's words, and it was impossible to get him to play in a group. His eye gaze was odd and mostly went into space. In his second major case study, Asperger said Haro never would join a game with others and his lost gaze was often far away. Asperger said both boys should be treated with genuine care and kindness and true understanding and affection, his words. And he gave the boys specialized tutoring on the ward and play therapy. And these therapies are actually what we would recognize today. Children with autism are given special teacher's aids and they're given play therapy. And this is one of the reasons Asperger has been seen as progressive. But girls with similar traits, rece traits received very different treatment. In an unpublished case file I found, Asperger described Christina Burka in similar terms as he had the boys. She was, quote, difficult to influence from the outside, closed, inhibited, hard to reach. She, quote, never cared for other children. Asperger's clinic uh, concluded that Christina simply had no gamut, and you can see that underlined, kind gamut. But Asperger felt that Christine did not struggle with a psychiatric condition, she was simply of a bad sort. She had a moral failing. And you can see Asperger's diagnosis in his terrible handwriting. He was born left-handed, and so he was writing with his right hand, um, and said she had a character variant of egocentric, vulgar, oppositional, and underhanded. And she posed a significant criminal threat. I mean, a girl drawing tulips is really posing 
a criminal threat. And Asperger ordered Christina's transfer to a correctional institution. These other unpublished case files I found, I saw that Elfrida Groman and Margarita Schaffer met even worse fates. Asperger's clinic said that Margarita did not participate at all in the community of children. Her facial expression was remarkably empty and she would stare impassively before her with lack of contact. So this is exactly how he was describing the boys. Elfrida was supposedly oblivious to the effect of her entire behavior on others. Asperger's Clinic transferred both of these girls to Spiegelgrund. Clinic notes here state that staff introduced Margarita to Erwin Jekelius, the murderer of uh, Spiegelgrund, suggesting she may have been pre-selected and she was transferred the same day. And here Asperger's Clinic specifies Elfrida should be sent to Dr. Illing's department, who at the time was responsible for the killings. So Elfrida already had a sense of foreboding before her transfer. She wrote in a letter to her mother, which was in her file, which meant the letter was never delivered. I do not know if we will see each other again because I can't know if I won't die on this trip. Thankfully, there is no record of these girls' deaths despite them being handed over to the killing center. But the fact remained that Asperger knew that death was a potential treatment option for these girls and issued boys and girls with similar characteristics, horrendously different fates. So Asperger's eugenicist view of gender was of a piece with his eugenicist view of autistic psychopathy in general. So some laud Asperger's effusive language about the highly original genius of children on the most favorable end of the autistic range. And he said they made excel in science or technical professions. But this benevolent rhetoric is really in keeping with Nazi child psychiatry. You may be surprised. These murderers say very positive things about some of children who are disabled. And why are they saying positive things? They want to raise the esteem of their profession and say that they can bring these children into the folk. They don't want to be treating children that are all seen as um, unworthy. So it's in their interest to tout children with special abilities. Now, Asperger had a bifurcated sense of disability and made a harsh distinction between children he saw as worthy and unworthy. And he said autism ranged. And now this is in his famous thesis that we go by today, quote, down to the most automaton-like mentally retarded individual. They would grow up, he said, to roam the streets as original, grotesque and dilapidated. These children could not and would not be helped. Thus, by 1944, as he sought promotion under Hamburger, Asperger's definition of autistic psychopathy was entirely shaped by Nazi institutions in ideology. After the war, Asperger claimed that he had resisted Nazism and defended children from the euthanasia killings. And I don't deny he may have rescued some children. There is no written evidence that he did, although I wouldn't foreclose the possibility that he did deem some children worthy. That does not undo the fact that he definitely transferred dozens of children to their deaths. What I find interesting is he distanced himself from his Nazi era work on autistic psychopathy. He scarcely wrote of it again. He published over 30, 300 articles in the post-war period and only a handful on autistic psychopathy, mostly for newsletters. Rather, he published on religious themes, social commentary about child rearing. And Asperger really should have been a footnote in the history of autism, had it not been for this woman, Lorna Wing. Lorna Wing was a leading British psychiatrist who publicized Asperger's diagnosis almost 40 years later. Now we're in 1981. Wing had switched fields to child psychiatry when her daughter Susie was diagnosed with autism and she conducted extensive research, far more research than Asperger ever conducted on youths who she felt did not quite fit Kanner's definition. And in presenting her work, Wing called the typology Asperger syndrome as a professional courtesy as she had tracked down his 1944 thesis. I also wonder 1981 if it might help to have a man's name on the diagnosis rather than a woman's name. 
Um, but what Wing was describing was her own diagnosis, not Asperger's definition. And most importantly, she wanted to present a neutral condition. So she called it a syndrome rather than a psychopathy. So Wing also cleansed Asperger's fascist rhetoric and pejorative claims about the sadistic and grotesque characteristic of children with autism. So we should really be calling this Wing syndrome, not Asperger syndrome. As Lorna Wing's idea of a broader autism spectrum gained traction in the 80s and 90s, the American Psychiatric Association added Asperger disorder to the American Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-IV, in 1994. And why his name was not researched and vetted is an open question I'm ha happy to discuss. Um, usually when you come up with an eponymous diagnosis, you're supposed to do dil due diligence onto who that person was. So then we get this rainbow uh, model of autism that takes hold in the public mind. And it's basically an IQ chart. On the far right is Kanner's classic definition of autism, children with greater impairments with Asperger's on the far left. And because Asperger disorder was increasingly called high functioning autism, it was reclassified in 2013 as autism spectrum disorder in the DSM-5. So Asperger disorder no longer exists as a standalone diagnosis in the DSM-5. Yet socially, Asperger's name remains in wide usage. I'm sure you've all heard people described as Asperger's. It is an identity for millions of people, a term we apply to loved ones and a personality stereotype in popular culture. You can see this article just came out last week. The rainbow has changed, although not really, right? Um, most of us never think about the man behind the name. Does the man matter? In my opinion, to medical ethics, it does. In medicine, naming a disorder after someone is meant to credit that individual for discovering a condition and to commend them with an honor. And arguably, I say Asperger merited neither. First, as I showed, he did not discover the condition. His portrayal of autistic psychopaths is at odds with understandings of autism today. We don't see children with autism in terms of sadism and depravity. Besides, Asperger's fascist idea on social spirit or gamut was not even his own. He was following in the footsteps of his senior colleagues in Nazi child psychiatry. Second, Asperger does not merit the honor of an eponym. He sent dozens of children to their deaths as a conscious and willing participant in this program of systematic killing. So since my book has come out, <laughs> I have proposed that we discontinue the Asperger eponym. And this has generated a great deal of discussion. Although I don't think it's really penetrated popular culture to the way that I wish it that it had. Other conditions named after Nazi era doctors who were involved in programs of extermination now go by alternative names. Reiter syndrome, for example, is now reactive arthritis. And medicine in general is moving away from eponymous diagnoses toward more descriptive labels. What's the problem? We still don't have an adequate vocabulary to describe autism. Children diagnosed with the condition can bear extremely little resemblance to one another. Researchers suggest that autism is kind of a catch-all term, it's a garbage bag collection that encompasses many physiological conditions that will one day be split into different diagnoses or different subtypes. If you think about it, most psychiatric conditions, you can take a designated pill that treats a physiological reaction. Well, autism doesn't have that. Kids take different pills and um, we just don't know how to disaggregate them yet. But right now it's an expansive umbrella diagnosis. And so I make the analogy to the diagnosis of female hysteria in the 19th and early 20th centuries, which lumped together women who had different underlying conditions, schizophrenia, epilepsy, syphilis, bipolar, anxiety. And science was not yet at a point to disaggregate those diagnoses. But I think it's an interesting question in the absence of more definitive science the, exp the extent to which psychiatric diagnoses are open to cultural influence. So at a time when women were asserting visible roles in public life, 
the image of the hysterical woman captured the public mind. And now I would argue the idea of the autism spectrum draws on anxieties about our children's integration into a perfectionist and fast changing world. I mean, it's crazy, one in 36 children are now diagnosed. So on the one end, a youth with autism might face a lifetime of severe disability and isolation, and on the other end, adapt and be perceived to have superior abilities. Elon Musk is claiming Asperger's. I don't know if you know that, but that's why he says he's building rockets. He's playing into this eugenicist uh, model. So hysteria was a diagnosis of overly emotional women. Well, now if you think about it, autism is a diagnosis of under emotional boys. And the ratio of diagnosis is still around five to one boys to girls. And the main image is white, urban, suburban, middle class. And this is not to deny the very real challenges, of course, of children diagnosed with these conditions. But my aim here, this whole talk, is to show how psychiatric diagnoses can be fluid things. And definitions emerge from the interactions of patients, doctors, social forces, and politics in a continual feedback loop. And diagnoses change over time. And in pointing out this changeability, I hope to underscore the ethics of respecting every child's mind and treating those minds with care, showing and warning how society can so easily issue labels, medications, and interventions. And so may this research give us pause in, con in considering how we describe and portray our children and inform our discussion how we go from here. Thank you. Shepherd, thank you oh, very thank much you. for that talk. I think we have time for a, a few questions. Um, Steve? Uh, I wonder, uh, fabulous talk. Thank oh, you very thank much you. for uh, coming. Uh, I wondered if you could comment on the influence of the Vienna practice in the rest of the, the third right era uh, uh, and in, maybe in Germany or other countries and other Sure, that's a great question. I should have said out front, Vienna really was a node of Vienna of child psychiatry. Um, Franz Hamburger was an extremely busy man. He hosted a number of conferences in Vienna, inviting people from all over the Reich. And um, Schroeder was an important node in the system. They were very tied to the Leipzig school. Uh, Spiegelgrund was the second largest killing center in the Reich, and um, it's complicated, but Hans Heinze, who was tied to Schroeder, was training doctors and sending them to Spiegelgrund. And there was a lot of overlap, too, in the tuberculosis research. So, um, I mean, Leipzig was an important node, but Vienna was very close after that, and they were very integrally tied, training with each other and going to the same conferences. Sure, so I'll preface this by saying American audiences have been extremely receptive. <laughs> extremely receptive. And um, the book has been translated into 12 languages and it has done very well in many countries except Germany. It got about a third tier publisher in Germany um, and Austria and it's done very well in a lot of other places. So I'm not taking it that personally. But um, I will give an anecdote. I was on a panel at the European Society of Child, Psychiat Ad Child and Adolescent Psychiatry with another man who uh, researches the euthanasia angle. And it was packed with Asperger's former colleagues, including supposedly his daughter. And um, we got the most raucous pushback. It was unimaginable. So for example, Asperger claimed that he'd been um, that the Gestapo had tried to arrest him. And this, there's no written record of this, but one of the audience members 
waived a notarized form saying that all five children had said that Asperger talked around this at the kitchen table. And so this was proof. And I could go on, but yes, I don't think it's been absorbed. And what? Yeah, you get the picture. Um, yeah. And so, you know, in a situation like this where you have demonstrated evidence that um, you know, he he didn't diagnose the disorder and really did, you know, uh, terrible things. What's the process for trying to get his name removed from a medical condition? Is is it just, you know, sort of a, a wave of people's interest or is there a functional process for removing his name? Um, I mean, that's that's the question, right? So it's already been functionally removed from the DSM-5 in 2013 before this research came out. And then when the book came out, there was, you know, a burst of articles about it. But I think that Asperger's name has come into usage. I would say anecdotally, my son has been diagnosed with everything on the spectrum. And I feel like I have heard people use the term more on the spectrum. But I really do think the problem is we don't have a vocabulary. People have tried to use functioning labels, low functioning, high functioning, mid functioning, which I think are equally problematic. Um, but um, I think we're just left without a vocabulary. Well, I'd be curious if other people have ideas how to remove the eponym. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. I think exactly what's happening here today, right? Showing up, mulling these issues, seeing connections between your field and other fields, and really holding into account these labels. Um, I mean, I, I could go on about people in medical humanities who are working on these questions, but the, the, the importance is having a dialogue, right? And having visitors like me come and talk. Only rather than 
You're not only a resident, you're a great resident. So <laughs> thank you um, for, for bringing that up. And I mean, I do think it's upon all of us to advocate and to be ethical and to constantly challenge the world that we're in and make sure that we are providing the best possible care for patients that, that's evidence-based and, and doing research and advocating for our patients. So um, we, we are committed to continuing to provide transgender and gender affirming care here. There is a temporary restraining order for the Attorney General's uh, lawsuit and the ACLU and Lambda uh, Legal have sued the state of Missouri and the Attorney General to um, block um, the prohibition on gender affirming care. So um, they still stand to a decision on that. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. It was my pleasure.